Welcome, everybody, and welcome, everybody else trickling in. This is a recap of Superset in 2022, and I wanted to start off by just making up our quick introductions here. My name is Evan Rusakis. I am a developer advocate. I'm a Superset PMC member, and I work for Preset, and I'm a front-end engineer, typically former designer, and just interested in all sorts of different stuff. I'll pass it over to Shreeshan. Yeah, and I'm Mukherjee. I've been a DevRel engineer here at Preset almost coming up to a year now. Prior to this, I was mostly data engineer. Didn't really work with the Superset project, but was familiar with Apache by Spark and all of that. So it was cool to come in and see the most popular project that Apache has to offer. But yeah, and I think the next slide, I'll also just be covering this for the one person that says they don't know what Superset is. So just quickly, Superset is an open source. Next slide, please. Yep. Thank you. No, it's all good. So Superset is an open source BI platform. It works with nearly any SQL speaking data engine and offers a large diversity of charts to create dashboards and visualize your data. And since this is a preset event, a next slide. Since this is a preset event, we're just going to plug preset really quick. What is preset? Preset Cloud is multi-workspace cloud-hosted Superset with all of the capabilities of Superset. We layer onto SOC to compliance. We provide end-user documentation provide various controls like row-based access controls, single sign-on, enterprise support, and we offer a managed embedded SDK. Preset, next slide. And then Preset Managed Private Cloud is Preset's BI platform for your AWS private cloud with all of the same capabilities as a Preset Cloud with additional enterprise support. Yep. And so if you'd like to learn more about Preset, please visit our website, but that's not what we're here to do today. Really, we're here to talk about the community event and the, the the year in review for Superset. So community matters. What's new that you have access to as open source users and contributors to Superset? So the agenda today is to recap some stats from 2022 and some of the major achievement in, achievements in terms of the project. And then we want to look forward a little bit into this year that we've just kicked off and how we're setting and tracking some of our goals. And then we want to open the floor for Q&A at the end. So we'll reserve you know 10 or 15 minutes. First off, major achievement in terms of Superset's popularity, we've reached 50,000 stars on GitHub. Now, this is an interesting kind of vanity statistic, you might say. It, a lot of people star a project on GitHub for a lot of different reasons. That might be that you want to contribute to it, you want to use it, you're just interested in tracking the activity of it. Who knows? We don't know everybody's motivations, but 50,000 stars is a lot, more than almost any Apache project and more than a whole lot of projects out there in the world. So it's a big thing. If we look a little closer at those stars, it's kind of interesting that the number of stars per month is remaining pretty steady. Don't mind the little dip in the end of December there. That just happens at the holidays periodically, it seems. And if you look at the people who have created those stars on GitHub and what organizations they're affiliated with on GitHub, you get this little bubble chart here. So those seem to be the orgs that are paying attention to Superset, which is kind of interesting in its own right. Now, as far as global additional repo, kind of macro trends on the repo, it's worth looking at these. We already talked about stars. These are accruals. So, you know, additional people starring and forking and watching month over month. The forks one is great to see remaining steady because these are people that may be either deploying Superset and customizing it, or they may be people that are looking to develop and contribute to Superset or all sorts of different stuff. But these are typically people that are remaining very involved with the project. Watchers are going down month over month for some reason. I'm not sure exactly what's behind that, but I'd love to hear your theories if you have any. And then as far as actual activity on the repo, there's GitHub issues and GitHub PRs. And compared to 2021, there are a lot fewer issues that were opened which is fantastic. Having fewer issues is a good thing. It means the product is maturing and stable. At least that's the way I'm interpreting this. And as you can see, the closure rate here is a little less in, in 2022, but it's worth pointing out that for both issues and PRs, these are the issues that were opened in 2022, but the closure stat is up to date. So as of yesterday, this is the percentage of 2021 issues that are now closed and the percentage of 2022 issues that are now closed. So that means we still have 2021 issues that are open and need tending to. So we'll talk more about how you can get involved with that later. But the number of issues overall on the repo is dropping, which is a fantastic thing. We're hoping to see that number go down and down over time. So yeah, lots of stuff going on there. In terms of 
pull requests, people actually contributing code to the project, there was a little bit less than the prior year in terms of PRs. What does that mean exactly? It's hard to say because, you know, lines of code, number of PRs, number of commits, things like that. They're good indicators that the project is really busy, but they're not necessarily a fantastic measure of progress. It's hard to measure engineering success in terms of these sorts of things, but there's a lot of stuff happening in Supersets code base. And that's the important takeaway. Also on the GitHub repository, I wasn't sure if everybody's aware of this, but GitHub discussions are becoming more and more of a thing. You can see that it's this trending upward and we're happy to see that. We're trying to make it so that GitHub issues are basically bug reports. And if you have other things that are sort of Q&A topics or feature requests or design suggestions, things like that, those can go into an ideas forum or a Q&A forum or things like that. So please check out GitHub discussions. And then Slack, Ashrishan, if you'd like to talk about yeah. this. So the Superset Slack community has again nearly doubled this year from 5,500 at the start of the, of the year to about 8,500 members. And if you're interested in seeing our 2021 recap, we started at around 2,500 members and we grew that to 5,500. So uh, next slide. And the following metrics also doubled or more. So weekly active members, we started with about 300 at the start of 2022 to about 600 at the end of 2022. And what you see there is our spikes in activity by our active members, usually around superset events, some sort of a new release or a feature. And similarly, weekly active members posting messages also grew from about 50 at the start of 2022 to 125 at the end of 2022. So we're excited to see that our Slack is growing and we're leaving to hope. We're leaving to, we're hoping to leave fewer and fewer questions unanswered. Then as far as Slack users go, it's worth pointing out that we do have a few folks in the community that have been doing an awful lot of work there. And I want to recognize that achievement. These are people from different organizations and different roles in the community. And we really love to see this kind of diversity in, in terms of who's helping out on Slack, answering questions and all sorts of stuff. So please join the crowd if you have the time and inclination. And then if you do want to do so, these are the front runner Slack channels, which tend to be the places you should jump in and help. And as you can see, beginner questions is, you know, near the top in terms of messages posted and people actually there. A lot of folks post all sorts of questions in these channels. So if you are someone that uses or deploys or maintains Superset, we'd love to get you involved and help answer some of these questions to unblock people in the community and keep them more involved as well. Uh, then. Overall project maturity, it's worth pointing out that in Superset 2022, there were a lot of releases. We're going to go into these in a second, but also these releases are getting used a lot, as you can see by these download statistics from Python. Now, the releases that came out, you can get all of the info on these from both the release page on the repo, as well as the change log, if you want to look at the individual bits of code via PRs that went into them. I should have mentioned earlier, but there's going to be a lot of QR tags in these slides, so you don't have to go typing long URLs if you have the technology to, to just grab those. But these are the six releases that came out in 2022, and we use a semantic versioning on our project now. So Superset 2.0 was a major release, which means there were some breaking changes that came out. And But we've also been providing long-term support for the 1.x, in our case, 1.5 releases as well. And 2.0.1 is the newest patch release for Superset 2.0. And this is a really important one for a number of reasons. A ton of bug fixes went into this because it was a long time after 2.0 was released before we were able to put out a patch release. So there's a slew of bug fixes here. And a lot of those were actually security patches that are very important. And many of these were recently backported to 1.5. So if you're still on 1.5, you will want to upgrade to the latest patch version there. But this also gives a lot of people the opportunity to jump and upgrade to 2.0 since that is much more stable, much more secure now. And we'll talk about future releases later in the presentation. But if you want to read all the details about 2.0.1 and what kind of configuration changes you might need to make and things like that, there's a blog post all about that you can check out. In the community, we have a whole bunch of new folks joining us in an official capacity. So we have committers and PMC members on the project. These are our two new committers, Diego and Steven, as of 2022. And committers are basically people that can merge PRs, officially review code. They can triage issues and PRs and add labels on the repo, things like that. 
And then we also have some people that have been upgraded to PMC, which means the project project, project management committee. And these, these folks were voted in to help manage the project at large, including security issues and other procedural things. They have binding votes if we're looking for Apache consensus on projects, stuff like that. So welcome to all of them. And all those people are on Slack, I should say, by the way, feel free to reach out to PMC and, and, and committers as well. As far as becoming one, in case anyone's curious about how that works, in 2022, we published brand new guidelines on what it should take, where we're setting the bar on becoming a committer on the project or becoming a PMC member once you're a committer. So feel free to read up on that. And it's also worth noting that you can, of course, be a contributor to Superset without being a committer. We take PRs and issues and all that stuff from anyone. So please jump on in. All right, and now the juicy stuff. We wanna get into some selected highlights of new features and things that were built into Superset during the 2022 year. There's a blog post about this same kind of presentation that has a longer bullet list. We're not gonna go into everything here, but we wanna cover what you can kind of see. So I'll hand it over to Shreesha. Yep. So Superset has added three new supported databases to its list of supported database connections. But just remember that Superset works with nearly any SQL speaking data engine, as long as that database has a Python DB API driver and a SQL Alchemy uh, dialect. And if, if those two requirements are met, you can go ahead and put up the official support yourself for that database. Or if you're not technical enough, maybe put it into like an ideas thread on GitHub and request it. Someone who knows what they're doing can do that for you. About couch right. Coincidentally enough, somebody just opened a PR today to add a new database to the quiver. So that's great. And so Superset also has an embedded SDK. We won't get too much into that. Stay in touch and subscribe to our newsletter. We'll have an event where we really demo how to get started with embedding your dashboards. But in the meantime, you can read more about the SDK at this link itself. And I'm just gonna also copy paste it for anyone who didn't want to scan that QR code. As you can see by the NPM download stats, it's getting more popular. This is becoming much, much more of a topic on GitHub and Slack conversations as well. So if you're using it or would like to use it, please jump in and we'll all find our way. Okay, getting into some more sort of features. View as table is a new feature we added to dashboards. So as you can see, you just click that contextual menu, click view as table, and now you can see all of the data points in tabular format with searchability that underlie your chart. It's just kind of the raw data in vanilla format. Then beyond that, we added drill to detail. And it's worth noting that this is behind a drill to detail feature flag. But the idea here is that you can click or right click rather parts of your chart. So in this case, we're illustrating this with a pie chart where you can click a certain wedge. And when you right click that, it opens up the table of much more granular data. Uh, and it applies a filter for the part of the chart that you clicked and selected. So this should allow people to gather a lot more insight of what's, you know, beyond their, the chart you see on the page in terms of granularity. But actually this screenshot that I have here is a little bit outdated because we also have this new toy that is now implemented in, or actually was in 2022, implemented in the drill to detail feature, which is a new uh, table component. And this is built around AntD, which is our React component library that we're using for building all sorts of stuff in Superset. But this table supports all the new bells and whistles, you know, client and server side pagination, virtualization, cell and header renderers, sortable, all resizable columns, all the bells and whistles. And that's in the drill to detail feature now, but also coming soon in lots of other areas of Superset. And another new component you're going to see in a lot of places is this metadata bar component, which will give you a lot of contextual information around superset objects like your charts and your dashboards to see who made them and when and where they belong. And that is used in a lot of places like the new cross references you'll be seeing between charts and dashboards. So a lot of times you'll want to know uh, in which dashboards is it is this particular chart I'm looking at used. So this will help you kind of consider when these things are important and you might not want to be editing or deleting them and all sorts of other uh, ways of kind of finding your, your way around when you're using Superset day to day. Both those components and more in the future are going to be part of the new burgeoning Superset design system. And what this really is, is a big effort to provide systematic, well-documented components to developers and 
these components are following all the new best practices around current patterns and standards and testing and styling and all that good stuff. And you'll be hearing an awful lot more about this in a blog post and probably a meetup coming soon to explain the whole concept. But for right now, you can read a little bit about it and look at these new components and actually test them out in a variety of different contexts by looking at Superset's React Storybook, which you can run locally if you're a developer, but also there's a publicly hosted instance behind this QR code or URL. And on this one over. Yeah, so RLS for SQL Lab is a brand new feature as well. So just quickly, role level security is something that you that enables you to use group membership or like an execution context to control access to rows in the database table. So put simply, like a manager might be able to, you know, select star view all of their employees' um, personal pay information. An employee themselves might not be able to select star and view, you know, that kind of data. So Superset now has support for role level security in SQL Lab. Security in Superset itself is handled by Flask App Builder, which is an application development framework built on top of Flask, and it provides the authentication, user management, or permissions, and rules. So setting data access rules is much simpler in Preset, which is the top left screenshot that you're seeing there. Uh, the data access configuration UI is something that's exclusive to Preset, but those configurations are identical to what you would see in the Flask App Builder for Superset. The actual RLS configuration UI will be the same for both superset and preset, which is what you see in the bottom right. And before I forget, here is the link where, since this is a superset event, you can read more about the superset security there. Fabian, I did see you, by the way, we're going to have a Q and we're going to have time for Q&A at the end. So that, that's, a, that's a question I'd rather explain out loud than just type an answer to. Yeah, other folks are welcome to add questions too. That we'll get to. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have time for it. Okay, the visualization picker in Superset got a few updates. One obvious one being this feature tag, which really tells you these are kind of the latest and greatest charts that follow all the best practices, and these will be supported for a while very actively by the community. There's a couple of other things added here, like you can actually deprecate a chart, meaning removing it from this view if you're an administrator of a Superset deployment. And there's a couple other little things we threw in, like better fuzzy search in this area and um, more examples, thumbnails, things like that and the ability when you're adding a new chart to just double click the icon which is super handy instead of looking for that create button this is a fun one to smooth out the user experience in the explore tool that we added a quick viz switcher so these are the top most used visualizations and when you're creating a chart you can very quickly change different types of charts and what really makes that feature useful is a whole bunch of backend work here that went into safer and smoother visualization switching. So when you fill out your form data in this control panel to create a chart, and then you want to switch charts, it used to be that it would just nuke all of that control panel data. But now we actually keep track of everything in kind of a big object. So if you, if you have some settings set that are for one particular chart and you move away from it and you come back, it will restore those settings. Also things like metrics and dimensions are you know, normalized and denormalized when moving from chart to chart. So it will keep the appropriate settings as best it's able. So we hope this makes it much smoother and less frustrating to explore different types of visualizations when you're creating stuff. Then also a smoother flow in terms of UX is a new way of jumping directly from a SQL lab query right into chart creation. When you click this button, you immediately now start creating a chart. And when you go and save that chart is when you'll be creating a data set instead of requiring a data set creation up front. So this not only smooths out the procedure of just getting right to where you want to be, but also prevents you from cluttering your superset workspace with a whole bunch of unneeded data sets that were used for exploratory purposes. And also smoothing things out in terms of cognitive load when moving from dashboard into explore is that now if you have a theme applied to your dashboard, you'll not only see consistency in series data, for example, ships is yellow here and ships is yellow here on two different charts in the same dashboard, but when you go and look at one of these individual charts in the Explore tool, it brings in that color palette that was used on the dashboard you're coming from and everything remains consistent. So you can kind of, doesn't, you know, skew your thinking when you are suddenly jarringly moved to a different color palette. Uh, horizontal filter bar. We talked about embedded for a second, but this 
is a very commonly requested feature that people wanted in their embedded use cases, but also a lot of people are really enjoying it for just day-to-day -day user experience as well. But this little gear button here, you click that and you can choose whether you want your native filters, dashboard native filters, that is to be displayed vertically or horizontally. And if there's too many to fit in this row, they go into that little overflow menu as we just saw. So please give it a try. That's behind a feature flag as well for now. Uh, business types or advanced types, some people call them. This is a kind of a lot to gloss over in a, in a minute here, but the idea is that the column model has been extended so that you can give a column of data a business type. The superset is now shipping with IP addresses and ports as initial examples of this, but you can develop your own. And pardon me for a moment while I move this little window. And so in this case, for example, if you were to type an IP address in this format, it actually gets converted into a different data format that will then apply to your ad hoc filters and other queries behind the scenes. And it also includes validation methods to make sure that what you're typing maps to the underlying format. So you can create one sort of format that relates to another. And this definitely helps when you have different tables from different data sources that use different formats of the same thing. But you can read up a lot more on that if you try, if you look up SIP 78. The handlebars chart is a new thing as well. This is a little bit of a beta, beta viz plugin, you might call it. There's still a few quirks. We're working it out. It's getting better by the day. And there will be a blog post coming about the intricacies of all of this soon. But the idea is that you can map your data to a bit of handlebars templating and HTML in this plugin. And you can also add a uh, fairly arbitrary CSS styling to it. So really, what can you do with this? These are a couple of very basic examples, creating here sort of an and on chart to kind of say, you know, red, bad, green, good for a particular data point. You can also create custom tables, really anything you want that's HTML based that can just kind of map through your data. There's common helpers built in for math operations and you know, use dynamic background images or emoji or whatever you want. Sky's the limit. You can even do SVG tags if you want to get super crazy with things. But yeah, try it out. It's very, very interesting. It opens a lot of doors for those who are not finding the plugin they want to do fairly simple display things. Generic x-axis. This is also behind a feature flag called generic chart axes. And the idea here is that we wanted to take some of the newer charts, particularly e-charts ones that were called time series charts and make them not specifically time series. So now you can actually add a categorical x-axis to a lot of different chart types, line charts, area charts, bar charts, that sort of thing. So instead of there being the time section that used to be in this part of the controls when you have this feature flag turned on, it's gone. It's no longer relevant because now you can drop a time column in here or you can drop a dimension in here with categorical information and your chart will work. And along with that, getting rid of the time section, which was largely used for time range filtration, we've now moved time range fil filters into the ad hoc filters section, which not only gives it a new home, but adds additional capability where you can add more than one ad hoc temporal filter here. So you might want to filter you know, a, a data set to maybe have one filter for a shipped on date and one filter for a received on date. So you can find the shipments that fit both those requirements just as a random example. And now we'll go ahead and look ahead to 2023 a little bit. We're not gonna go into too many specific features here, but just a little bit of the process of how we're thinking about these changes coming up and how you might be able to kind of get some context on those and get involved if you're so inclined, which we strongly encourage. We do have new releases coming up. 2.0.2 is in the works right now. If Reach out to me on Slack if you have anything that you're clamoring to get in there, but it's basically another patch release, so bug fixes, security fixes, that sort of thing. We hope to have a 2.1 release, which would be a new cutoff of master so that those running the 2.0, which is current release, will get additional features that have been on the repo in recent months. And then coming up, as many people have asked about, is the 3.0 release, the next major release, which according to the semantic versioning thing means we can bring in some breaking changes that which might be getting rid of old charts or removing some feature flags and things like that. Uh, so if you want to get involved with 3.0, what it is, what it might be, you can check out this project board that's on the Git repo, which is where we're going to be kind of capturing puzzles for a lot of these changes. 
then these will be brought to the Apache mailing list and Slack channels and everything else for discussion and consensus to officially carry some of these individual tasks into the release. And if you want to make requests for the 3.0 release, that should be, you know, kind of bite-sized since we want to get this out probably early spring, then you can drop them in this discussion thread here since most people don't have the privileges to modify the project board itself. We're not going to guarantee anything making it in. These are just requests, but feel free to drop those. Also, in terms of projects that may or may not be part of the 3.0 thing, we just started a the humble beginnings of a superset community roadmap, another GitHub project where we're just kind of tracking some of the, the big moves, not granular tasks, but in larger initiatives that are taken on by individuals or organizations that are working on superset. And each of these has a little bit of information like the relevant Slack channel, relevant SIP, superset improvement proposal, or other documentation and uh, synchronous meetings, things like that, that you can get involved with. We just mentioned the superset improvement proposals. A lot of these are also being tracked here. Some of them are taking place right now in terms of kind of long tail changes that we're making in the product. And some of them are being proposed right now. So you might want to look through those that are in discussion. And you're also able to open your own if you want to make and kind of own a larger change in the superset product. And then if you want to get involved in any or all of this stuff, I wanted to expose people to what we're calling the superset operational model. There's going to be a blog post coming out in just a couple of days about this, really. But the idea is that we have these town hall events where everybody in the community is welcome to come and kind of talk about the development of the project. And these community discussions that happen on GitHub and Slack and everywhere else are proposed as agenda items into a big Google document that we take to town hall. We all sit down and talk about it and figure out how we can break it into actionable chunks, which are then handed off to working groups like security developer experience, you know, and those working groups have their own processes, Slack channels, meetings, and so forth that you're welcome to get involved with. Like if you want to talk about releases, go to the release meeting. And those actions and discussions are brought back to the next town hall for everybody to know kind of where we're at. So it's a bit of a cycle and you're more than welcome to participate. And all of the tasks that are happening in those working groups, well, hopefully all of them, at least the, the noteworthy ones are taking place on this GitLab project. So you can track those as well. More ways to get involved. If you're not already, please check out the Superset community calendar. That includes meetups like this one. It includes those town halls and all sorts of other events that the Superset community is welcome and encouraged to take part in. There's the Superset Slack. I couldn't generate a QR code for this because it's just a redirect from Bitly, but please join if you haven't already and get involved in some of those channels. We can use more voices. And then of course, GitHub issues. Not only are you welcome to file them if you have issues and bugs you're running into, but we would really appreciate the support and cleanup uh, going through the giant list of the ones we have today. And we can use validation. We can use all sorts of support question answering. So please jump in. And same with GitHub discussions. If you see something you don't like about Superset or you have a fantastic idea for it or whatever, we would love to hear that. So drop your ideas there. And last but not least, a Q&A. So now that we've gone on for a little while, we can open the floor to you guys to hear really any questions you'd like, but these are some example topics that we'd love to hear about in case you're so inclined. So with that, I'll stop sharing and... Hmm. So I, I can take the first question I saw in the Q&A poll. Fabian asked, how can I connect the view to a database? So please provide clarification. What I'm assuming here is you're talking about a virtual table or a view within Superset. So what that is, is it's essentially a SQL query that's running against your target database. You are creating a new data set. Now, if you want to productionalize that, or you know that that's something that you're going to reuse, what you want to do is make it available as a data set to Superset. So what I mean by that is create this data set in your database layer itself or have this transformation because at the end of the day, a virtual a view or a virtual data set in Superset isn't a materialized view. It's not a real data set. It's a SQL query you are rerunning every time you refresh that. I, I hope I answered that question. So I'm going to just click answer live there. I also saw one, I think it was Praneet asked, how about Couchbase? I don't. I've never heard of Couchbase. If there is a Python database API driver and it has a SQL Alchemy 
dialect, it will work. I promise you that. If it's something you're interested in seeing as like an officially supported and appearing somewhere in the SuperSet documentation, that's what like all of those resources were for. But that's how you would get that up there. And I see, does preset superset have FedRAMP certification for running in the Gov clouds in AWS and Azure? I, I don't, don't think so. I don't think so. I haven't heard anything about FedRAMP. We do have SOC2. Yeah. I think FedRAMP is another level over SOC2. I'm just talking about this from my prior experience. I know we have the SOC2 compliance. That, Mark, if you're interested in speaking to someone on our sales team, I'm happy to put you in touch for the okay. idea. Yeah. That I, that I personally don't think so, but we can find out for you. Okay. We do have some other governments that are using it, so it's you can, you can say that. And if you guys don't mind, just please use the Q&A tab rather than the chat. Yeah, somebody's having trouble adding the calendar. I don't know if anybody else had success with that. Generally, it seems to work. Strangely, you had to you have to be logged into a Google account to actually add it to your own personal calendar. But it should be public, and if you're having an issue, I'm not quite sure what it is. I'm sorry to say. I do see, I hope I'm saying it, Yakub, Jacob, thanks for the presentation. Are embedded dashboards a feature or of preset or superset? If the dashboard is embedded, do the users of my application have the option to modify it? Uh, again, depending on how you set up the RLS and what kind of permissions those viewers have, they can be just viewers. They might be just getting reports. You can control all of that permissioning on your own. We're just going to throw in another quick preset plug. Preset can manage all of that for you. And Superset, it's a much more manual process. You're going to be doing those controls yourself. But at the end of the day, it's how you embed that application. It's a feature for both Preset and Superset. It's just easier in Preset because we're our managed solution. I hope that answered that. I, I do see someone say presenters usually lock the chat for themselves and use Q&A for the audience. That's true, but I like having the chat open so the audience can do everybody. Yeah, it's nice to hear some of the little comments. Somebody said yeah. things, the temporal filters, and that's cool to hear because... I, uh, I, I, it doesn't feel like we're just talking to, you know, each other here when we see, like, people actually typing. How... I, I believe I answered that. Yeah, I think that question about connecting you to the database was answered. If there's a particular nuance to that that you'd like to cover, we can. Yeah. Can you address backup and restore? I find exporting is the best way so far. Oh, so actually what I can do is provide you with a link to a blog post that I wrote some time back about managing your dashboards as assets using code control. So like GitHub, you can find out a little bit about that. Yes, exporting is a way, but using the, the superset CLI or the preset, we also have our own CLI. You can source control all of your dashboards. So let me just find a link to that really quick, because that is a pretty common question actually that comes up. So this was just an example. This is from Mark's question. I'm gonna, I'll put the link in the chat. I did say answer live, but here you go. It's called dashboards, delivering dashboards as code. A lot of people tend to back up their metadata database as well, just for good measure, because that's just yeah. safe. <laughs> and then is, is there a blog that discusses deploying superset in an enterprise environment for multi-tenancy? If you find one, would love to read it. No, I have not written one of those, but I'm sure they exist. If There's actually people, quite a few people that cover it in different ways. I mean, people yeah. deploy the superset in different ways using different technologies, yes. multi-tenant or not, with different types of custom security managers and authentication and all sorts of things. So that's a whole universe of stuff unto its own. But if anyone is looking for, I, I got to say, it, an easy way to use, you know, multi-tenant superset and a scalable version of superset, that's, that happens to be what we do at preset. So yeah, free to try out. And then have I understood it well, all new releases of new versions are under preset and not superset ones. Um, I Yeah, you take, you take yeah, it. Yeah, so actually what preset does is decoupled from the official Apache releases of Superset. Preset tends to, well, we have a lot of fantastic QA resources and so forth. So we tend to be much closer to master than the official releases. So we've kind of put out the latest and greatest stuff with some additional layers of customization and enhancement. The official Superset releases are, are done by really anyone on the PMC that could be from any organization. 
but I, had, I admit preset tends to do a lot of them. And the idea here is that we just want to kind of provide these ongoing open source releases periodically to the community just to keep all of those semantic versioning or semver policies in place so we can have windows of opportunity to provide breaking changes on the repo and then you know follow up those major releases with feature releases and patch releases as well. So um, yeah, superset releases and preset releases are, are pretty different animals. We don't release the the superset releases every set we do our own thing. And there is a release strategy working group that's on that community calendar if anybody wants to go into the details of all that. Somebody says they can't see all the questions. I'm not quite sure. You should be able to see them in the answered section. Yeah, if you have uh, access to that Q&A tab. Yeah, and if I'm talking too fast or too quietly, hopefully when this is posted on YouTube, you know, you can kind of. I, I hope I, I, I'm pretty sure I read each question out loud, so it should be there. I'll put chapters on the YouTube link if that helps. Oh, maybe I skipped one. I'm not sure. Let's see. I read it out loud and then passed it to you, so we're good. <laughs> How do you change databases for a dashboard? I know you can change data sets very easily in explore for a particular chart this person wants to uh, oh i can do you want i, I can answer yeah. that how do you how do you change databases for a dashboard you have a there's a settings tab um so this is this is all going to be so we're talking about superset specifics here you just have to add a new database connection if you have this dashboard so th this is a particular issue though because your data sets are going to be identified differently so my advice rather than trying to change up the entire underlying database. If you have like a QA portion and like a production portion, just create them in separate environments. Um, but you can, you would, you have to do a lot of rewiring and making sure that the database name or the data set names themselves align. They're, you're, because your queries will break the queries powering all of your charts. So that's like a decision you kind of have to make when you're starting to create this a dashboard. That was uh, Peter's question about changing a database for a dashboard. He asks if there's any links to the handlebars charts shown in the example earlier. Not yet, but very soon. That's actually something I'm going to be working on starting tomorrow, honestly, to put some of these examples and some new ones, hopefully, on PubGist, and then put all of that into a blog post to kind of explain what makes them tick, what the limitations are, peculiarities, and all of that. Yeah, I hope to go deep and explain better how to use the handlebars chart going forward. Someone asked about, does the preset starter package offer the user the ability to publish and deploy dashboards to the web? The depends on what you mean by publish and deploy to the web. I mean, if you... If you have sufficient seats on your account, yes, anyone with an account can log in and look at the dashboards. If you mean embedding, I don't know exactly what how tiers affect the embedding feature, to be honest. Neither do do I actually on that one. That that would be a better question for our sales team there. Yeah, we can put you in touch with someone. Just reach out to yeah. either of us on Slack and we can connect you. Yeah. Then any links? Oh, do you have a link to the handlebar chart? Well, there, you said there's going to be a blog. So. Yeah, there's going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to write a nice long post for anybody that wants to play with it with kind of a, you know, beginner to advanced tutorial. And there's some more new color groups for visualization. I don't know. Well, about that. that's, so there's, again, not, try, not trying to keep this to community. If you are able to modify your code base to add additional color palettes, bake it in on your deployment, if you want to customize that way. Otherwise, if you happen to be a preset user, then there is a feature to add additional custom color palettes at a certain pricing tier. So that's something we offer to be more dynamic and less of a developer feature. Is there, okay, cool. So is there a way to export and import reports? Yeah, I believe so. The, like report, reporting should be automatic. So you can, I'll just try to, I'll just link you to the documentation on that. That's not something I specifically have worked with. So I don't know the mechanics behind that, but I do believe that it is possible. And I'm curious, maybe somebody can answer in the chat. Did anyone use those QR codes? Are those handy? I, I, oh, do you not see the poll? 
Oh, no, I didn't see it. I, I activated the poll. We got a 23% yes, 73% no. 3%. Oh, okay, I'll take it. All right, it's not a, not yeah. a waste to download dashboard as PDF. That's a fantastic question. I don't think you can expect it, but we would welcome it. This is one of those areas where it might be a great idea to put that on GitHub discussions as an ideas thread and see how many other people are willing to kind of back it figure out where the edges of that feature are and if there's any design implications that need to be dealt with there and then you know currently it's not slated on the roadmap but if anyone has the inclination to open some prs around it we would love to see that sort of feature somebody just added some excel spreadsheet exporting stuff for charts for example like you know these things do come from the community so we'd love to see it this is to can the audience see the answer tab by any chance in our Q&A? You can just use the chat. Oh, okay. Yep. Thank you. Oh, so one person can't see the answer for some. Oh. Don't worry, in the YouTube video, I'll, I'll make sure the questions are clarified. For those who can't see it, they're just to, of course, just to make sure it's, there is a Q&A button in your toolbar that pops open a separate window. Sorry, that's one of those tech support, is it plugged in questions, but see that. Oh, we got another view add table, table as CSV download. Yeah, you can already effectively do that in Explore. You can download the data from there. Frederick's question, how often can you auto update, refresh a superset dashboard? You can actually, I, I'm pretty sure it goes down to like the seconds. You can just pick your cache intervals, like even less than a second if you want. I'm actually trying to work on a semi real time dashboard right now. So I'm familiar with this. It'll all be your caching settings. If you want to see that or talk about it, I'm happy to point you in the right direction. All right. Seems like we're slowing down on questions. Yeah. Still have uh, 10 minutes. Feel free to ask. Oh, and also our blog post just got published about drill down. So maybe now is a good time to do that. Yeah, so what, okay, a blog post apparently just went out about drill to detail, which is a yeah. step along the way. I think I'm, I'm going to write another blog post that goes a little bit more into where drilling operations and superset in general are going. But where we're at right now is drill to detail. So from a particular, you know, bar on a bar chart or whatever, you can right click and you can say drill to detail and that'll add a filter for the bar you clicked, for example. The next thing we want to do is what we're calling drill by. So if you right clicked a bar on a bar chart, you would then get the option to drill by wherein you pick another dimension or column. And so you would essentially filter by the bar you click and then it would group by the dimension that you select. Um, and we haven't built that yet. That's just in, in planning right now. But that's kind of the next step along the way to what most people call drill down. Where drill down, the distinction is that you have an imposed hierarchy. So it might be, you know, state, city, zip. And those hierarchical relationships have to be managed at the semantic layer. And we don't have that feature right now. But we actually believe that the drill by feature I was just describing scratches that itch and more. So it actually is a more flexible option than a traditional drill down. So um, I'm already getting long winded here, but there will be a, a, we have drill to detail, which is fantastic. Now you can read about it and a lot more drilling operations are on the roadmap and you'll be hearing more about that future in much greater detail in blog posts, meetups and so forth. Thank you too, Jerry. Question. Thank you. Bye. Unless there are any last minute questions, we can give everyone their seven. Oh, here we go. Drill to detail is a feature flag. Where's the best place to find these flags? Doc? Ah, okay. I can tell you that. So in the repo, there is a feature flags MD, which I believe is stashed one directory deep. I forget the directory off the top of my head, but yeah, I could take a moment and find that. But yeah, there is a feature flags MD that breaks them down into categories. And those categories are like whether it's in development or if it's kind of in beta testing or if it's effectively deprecated. Oh, yes. So in the resources, you're going to share my screen probably. Yeah. There's this feature flags MD file within resources. And in here, you can see what's essentially in the works, 
what's in testing, what we've deemed stable, and deprecated ones. So for the 3.0 effort, we're actually going to be taking a pass at all of these and making sure that not only is this up to date, but where we want it to be going into the next major version release. So we'll probably remove a few feature flags, probably flip a few of them to be default true instead of false, or vice versa. But I hope that helps. And would you mind dropping that link in the chat? Just oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Just for anyone who might want to mark it later. There you go. Nice. Well, I hope uh, we'll, we'll just talk really slowly in case more questions come in in the next five minutes, but I hope everyone got something out of that. Thanks, Evan, for doing most of the talking here. Oh, and one last question. A blog post about annotation layers. That's an interesting topic. I haven't written one. That's not a bad one to write about. Not a bad idea at all. Also, yeah. that's that's another feature that kind of needs a bit of a revisit in terms of user experience. It's not the simplest thing to approach, but yeah, there's a lot of content to go into there. So that's a good idea. In the, in the meantime, what I could do is I'll just plug some more pre, preset documentation about annotations, if that helps, but we, 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 can, we can definitely keep it in on our radar to write about this if there's interest about this topic. Okay. Going once. Going twice. Cool. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one.